there's finally a new study that looks at visceral belly fat and how intermittent fasting in a 16-8 fashion influences it. But it didn't just look at fasting, it looked at 16-8 intermittent fasting ad libitum, just eating whatever you want, compared to 16-8 intermittent fasting combined with low carb, and then also compared to straight up low carb. Now it was really, really cool. So it was 169 people and they did this for three months. And it was published in the journal Cell Reports and it was a very comprehensive study. But there was a really big problem with this study that we need to address, okay? When they put people on a lower carb diet, this low carb diet was 130 grams of carbs. Now in the grand scheme of things, that is low carb but it's certainly not keto, okay? So we have to take this for what it's worth. Now, I want you to understand that the researchers here weren't naive. They weren't just saying like, oh, like this is keto, they're calling it keto. No, they were trying to follow American Diabetic Association ADA guidelines. Like, so the ADA says that 130 grams of carbs is considered low carb. And again, compared to most things, it probably is. But before you get really upset with the ADA on this, we have to realize like how far they've come. In 2008, the ADA was like hard opposed to lower carb protocols. In fact, they thought that they would cause problems for diabetics or for people that were dealing with blood sugar issues. In 2019, they revised everything and they actually became quite strong proponents of a lower carb protocol. And they even acknowledged that the body can create glucose and that the lower carb diets were not a problem because of glucose. They were concerned that if people ate a low carb diet that they would miss out on nutrients. I can understand how that concern would be there. So anyway, I'm not too worried about that, but we just have to take this all into consideration. So let's break down what the results of this study were after three months. So when it comes down to weight loss, the low carb group that had no real dietary restrictions other than low carb, they gave them recommendations on what to eat and what not to eat, but they lost 2.2 kilograms. The intermittent fasting group that was ad libitum, they could eat as much as they wanted to with no restriction as long as they 16-8 fasted. They lost 3.4 kilograms on average. The intermittent fasting plus low carb group ended up losing about five kilograms. So on the surface you think, okay, this is it. The answer is to intermittent fast plus low carb. But there's a couple things we need to pay attention to. One, this doesn't tell us everything. We wanna pay attention to this visceral belly fat. That's really important here. But the other thing is that this wasn't that low carb. It was 130 grams of carbs. So like, I don't know, it's not really like looking at fasting plus keto. But there's also something we need to note here. The low carb group and the intermittent fasting plus low carb group were given recommendations on what not to eat. The intermittent fasting only group that, did, that could eat ad libitum, as many carbs as they want, whatever, they were not given any recommendations. They were just given timing and they could eat whatever they wanted to. So had they been told maybe not to eat certain things, would they have had better results? Well, I think we'll understand a little bit more when we get further into this video. Now with visceral fat, visceral belly fat, this was the big thing. This is what we really needed to look at. And the results were pretty shocking actually. The low carb group had zero change in their visceral fat. They didn't lose any visceral fat. Reality is, is they were coming from probably a high carb diet and even reducing down to like 130 just didn't change their visceral fat that much. Then the intermittent fasting plus low carb group lost about 10 cubic centimeters of visceral fat. So they lost a good amount of visceral fat. Here's what's wild. The intermittent fasting group that was able to eat flexibly whatever they wanted to, they lost the most visceral fat, 13 cubic centimeters. What gives, like why is that the case? I mean, we could speculate. It could be the fact that because they were able to eat more things, maybe they ate more carbs and those were lower calorie, whereas the other group ate higher fat and was more caloric density. Maybe fat translates into visceral fat more than carb. I don't know, I don't have an answer, and the researchers didn't really either, which is quite shocking. But a lot of it may have come down to adherence. It also may have come down to the kinds of fats people were eating. We do know from some literature that saturated fat in high amounts can lead to more liver fat and visceral fat. So perhaps the lower carb groups were eating more fat and adding in more cheese and saturated fat, which again isn't bad in moderation, but if you go too far, there's a direct link between visceral fat, 
fatty liver and high amounts of saturated fat. So that could have been the thing. That could have been what was it because it was three months that could have stacked up. Realistically, if you're increasing your fat intake and lowering your carb intake, you'd want to be adding in things like olive oil and avocados and avocado oil and the macadamia nuts, things like that. Those are the kinds of fats that you want because they don't translate into that and they improve insulin sensitivity as well. Fun fact, I put a link down below for free macadamia nuts, literally like a free box of Nabibian sea salt macadamia nuts and 20% off whatever you want from House of Macadamia, whether it's macadamia nuts, whether it's macadamia nut oil, whether it's going to be sugar-free chocolate covered macadamia nuts, plus you get that free box of macadamia nuts, like literally a whole free box. I know I sound crazy when I say this, but literally that. So check them out. I put that link down below in the description on the top line just underneath this video. What's interesting though is when we break down the fasting groups into ETRF versus LTRF, because they did that in this study, you find that the early time restricted feeding group, the group that ate in the morning but fasted in the evening, they had slightly even better effects on visceral fat, but it still kind of adds up later on. Okay, because now we need to talk about glucose for a second. All groups, low carb, fasting ad lib and fasting plus low carb had reductions in glucose. They had improvements metabolically as far as their glucose markers were concerned. However, the fasting plus low carb was the only group to have an improvement in their HbA1c over these three months. That makes sense though. Fasting already tremendous for glucose, low carb good for glucose, combining them together, that eh, might just be the best, right? So that's no real surprise. Okay, let's move into sustainability. This is huge. When you looked at the adherence, the best adherence over the three months was from the intermittent fasting group ad libitum. The worst adherence was going to be the low carb plus fasting. But the low carb group had about 55 days of adherence. And when you analyze this and you talk to these participants, 98% of the intermittent fasting group and 98% of the low carb group said, I could continue on with this. Only 82% of the intermittent fasting plus low carb group said they could continue on. This is insanely important and outside of the belly fat literal hard data we're looking at, probably the most important thing. A lot less people were able to continue on or were willing to continue on with fasting plus low carb. And it's a testament to how diet rules will stack up against us. And eventually like we're left to just go with what's easily maintainable. So not only did we get the best result with intermittent fasting in an ad libitum fashion as far as belly fat was concerned, but we also got the best effect as far as potential sustainability and adherence. And that might be why we saw better outcomes is because when you look at the actual averages of who was able to stick with it, they were able to stick with it the best. But if you're thinking like I'm thinking, you might be wondering like if the carbs were actually lower and they weren't in this gray area of low carb, would the intermittent fasting plus low carb group or even the low carb group themselves, would they have had better visceral fat reduction? Well, with that, there was a study that was published in the journal Antioxidants that did find something pretty interesting with this. They found that when subjects went down to 50 grams of carbs per day for four weeks, they had insanely big reductions in visceral fat. But if you actually look deep at the details of that study, it was an 800 calorie diet between 700 and 900 calories. So a seven to 900 calorie ketogenic diet you're gonna have weight loss and you're gonna have weight loss in a lot of places. So unfortunately, I can't just totally take that to the bank. But there's other data that supports that the formation of ketones could direct where we burn fat. But there was a really recent study, 2023, like spring of 2023, published in Vitaminology that found that for 12 weeks, taking 2.9 grams of exogenous ketones daily led to a significant nine centimeter square reduction in visceral fat. Although this study is interesting, I think to get fair, accurate representation of a low carb, the carbs would need to be lower. However, what it does teach us is that intermittent fasting gets really a bad rap when in reality, it's highly sustainable and highly effective across multiple different categories. And it's slightly more effective if you're willing to be the weirdo that skips dinner. I'll see you tomorrow.